Hello, I'm John Spites. Welcome to the Veterans Roundtable. Our guest for this segment is a Raleigh resident, Mr. Charles Lloyd. Charles, we're delighted you're able to come by and share your knowledge with us today. John, it's good to be here, and uh, I think it's about time somebody knew what the U.S. Navy Armed Guard was. Mm -hmm. I might explain to our viewers, uh, Charles is a Navy veteran of World War II, and uh, um, uh, for some of our viewers, including myself, who uh, uh, have seen some movies of cargo carrying ships in World War II, of uh, merchant marine vessels, um, I was surprised to learn that um, uh, those movies weren't entirely complete, were they, Charles? No, they left out the armed guard. Mm -hmm. Could you, uh, yes, please uh, tell us briefly about the Navy armed guards? Well, we were just a special group of volunteers uh, that did a job in World War II that nobody knew about. We were the gunners and uh, signalmen and officers and radiomen that would serve aboard a cargo, army transport, the tankers and all that uh, made the Merrimack's run that carried food and provisions overseas to the troops and the guns and the ammunition and we protected the lives not only of uh, our lives but uh, the merchant marine that was doing a job uh, servicing the ship and getting the ship over there and also we protected many troops that was aboard these uh, cargo ships, along with all the tanks and ammunition, and, and uh, that's what our job is now today, is to try to tell a little something about it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, during the war, were you able to tell your families uh, what you were doing or the name of the ship that you were on at that time? No. When the first went in, the first uh, war started, uh, no one knew about it. I didn't know about it until when it started until uh, lately when we got involved with a reunion and got on a committee. Uh, this started when the Americans were, and British were losing so many ships, cargo ships, in 1940, 40, early 41. Mm -hmm. And the first armed guard crew was uh, actually in World War One. But it deactivated after World War One, and it's picked up again in April of uh, 41 when they sent them down to Little Creek, Virginia uh, for gunnery, troop, uh, uh, gunnery training, mm -hmm. which uh, later turned out to be Am Field Base, and we went next door at Camp Shelland, Virginia, which is, has been deactivated now, and we're out of service, But uh, and I hope we don't ever be needed again, but uh, that's our job. And there was 144,970 of us and 1,810 of them lost their lives. Plus the injured and uh, countless, we don't have a record on that, the injuries and what became of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Charles, you've been organizing veterans of the Navy Armed Guards and I believe you have a local meeting here once a month in Raleigh? Right, we meet out at the barbecue lodge uh, on number one north and it's just local and we have people coming from out of state now we put the word out and they're coming in and it's good for the armed guard and good for us and good for the community mm -hmm. and i believe during world war ii in addition to yourself your two brothers were also in the armed guard uh yes i had another brother uh lonnie that stays here in raleigh uh well, we were aboard the same ship we went in boot camp together and served together and on the same ship together and had one brother, Lonnie uh, Whitson, that was uh, one of the first armed guards that went in service. And uh, when he volunteered, uh, they, they didn't know what it was all about. And uh, if he'd have known, he probably wouldn't have joined it. But uh, thankfully, people like him and others uh, did join the armed guard and did a good job. And he was very fortunate. He had one ship to was sunk half on him in 1943 uh, in November uh, off of Newfoundland. But three days before uh, the war was over in, from the European theater in the Mer uh, Atlantic, he was the last armed guard that got killed in the North Atlantic off of Rhode Island. Oh, uh, huh? So in his uh, uh, second um, ship sinking, he died? That's right. Mm -hmm. He'd also had participated in the Merman's run, which was uh, 
I think about 16 ships out of 42 made it there and back. That's um, carrying cargo to Russia during World War II? To Mermaids and Archangel, Russia. In the uh, uh, Arctic Ocean area? That's right. But, um, uh, well, of course, we're very sorry that one of your brothers lost his life, but the other brother who was in the armed guard also lives here in Raleigh and um, is still alive. Oh, yeah, and we he's active, just as active I am on uh, uh, getting the group together, and we're working together with them, and uh, we started out with uh, 55 names. In our first reunion, we went up in Winchester, Kentucky, and had a ball, and the group... Up there, the group there uh, says if we bring it to North Carolina, they would uh, in turn carry it to Texas next year. So we did it. We carried it down to Wilmington, and we had about 200 armed guard plus their wives and uh, there, and went down to Texas, and we had about 400 plus their wives there this year in 1984. And next year, uh, April 24th through 28th, I volunteered, and my brother... Along with my brother. That's your, your brother, Mr. Lonnie. Uh, or Mr. L.D. Lloyd. That's right, here in Raleigh. We volunteered to host it again and to do it at uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and visit uh, <clears throat> Shelton area where we took our gunnery training there where men, the other one did, men did on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And if good luck happens in the all, we'll go to San Francisco in 1986. Well, you're putting in a lot of work to organize reunions. Well, it's not work. It's all play. Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> and I believe in that context, Charles, uh, you're putting the veterans of the armed guards onto computers for different purposes so that you can try to pair veterans who were shipmates during the war and get them That's together. Right. That's right. We just got uh, Andy Goodnight, which uh, was in the uh, Merkel Legion down at uh, Apex. We've just got him located with uh, a friend of his out in the western part of Virginia. And the first time they've been in contact with each other in 42 years, and they visited each other this past week. Uh, and it's just wonderful uh, that he went up to visit with him, and they had spent a good week together, and hopefully they'll come down and have breakfast with us in November. Mm -hmm. you, you've gotten uh, hundreds of letters from armed guard veterans? Uh, thousands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is this um, a sample of several... Yes, that's what came in yesterday. What thing? Oh, some of them did. I see one blue one there was <coughs> was uh, this one was a lady from uh, California. She was in the armed guard waves there at Treasure Island. And I like to say right here that there were three armed guard bases where we shipped out of, and uh, the one on the east coast was Brooklyn, New York, armed guard center, at Brooklyn. They won down in uh, Gulfport, Mississippi, and then a lot of them said it's New Orleans right there. And uh, mm -hmm. then we had the other one that was out in Treasure Island, uh, California. And uh, that's where most of them headquarters was out of. But they shipped out of every port, practically, uh, in the United States and went to almost every port in the world during World War II. Oh, mm -hmm. well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Our job, I dare, uh, I'd say right here, uh, John, our job was to man the guns, uh, keep up the equipment, and uh, protect from the planes, the subs, or any other apparatus or people that would attack us in World War II to get the, the provisions through. Mm -hmm. And that was our that was our main purpose. Uh, yes. Um, uh, incidentally, Charles, I believe you have a. Uh, the front cover of a newsletter that uh, was used during World War II was put out by the armed guard, I mean? Yes, this right here is one is called The Pointer, which was put out on the East Coast at Brooklyn, New York. And this particular picture here shows uh, nine liberated uh, armed guards after three-year internment, and they served off the SS Carlton, most of these did, and two of which, uh, these are POWs. And uh, they were sunk in, in the PQ-16, or 17 it was, uh, that was headed to Murmansk, Russia. Uh, that's the designation for a convoy of ships? That's right. And you might hear, uh, hear about, uh, or heard of Walter Conkright, and he's talking about PQ-16, which was in July, 1st of July, and PQ-17, which was July the 5th. Well, I know one of these guys that we're in contact with 
his ship got damaged by the Earl torpedo and they went back in port on PQ-16 and went back out on PQ-17 and July the 5th, uh, his ship got sunk and he was picked up by the Germans. Uh, one, of them, one of the crew got picked up by a seaplane, another got picked up by surf and carried into Norway. And that's where he stayed until after the war. Yes, uh, Charles, when there were American survivors and uh, lifeboats, uh, how did the German submarines uh, react to the lifeboats there? Uh, stories come in from every kind of source that we're getting there and trying to gather it up. Uh, normally, the Germans uh, came, surfaced, and uh, asked them did they have enough provisions, and if they didn't have the provisions, something like that. Sometimes they would give them uh, a little uh, food, crackers, uh, a compass and tell them which point them which way the nearest land was or if there's no one there and knew how to work the compass or anything and how to work it and on the way if they were going out they uh, didn't do too much for them because once they go out and come back in they they would uh, you know they were keep for space just like we were I thought they were all combined in and uh, before I'd forget it I, I'll say tell you that they had uh, about 600 submarines or more in World War II, maybe a seven or eight. And uh, 40,000 of their 60,000 submarine crew perished in World War II. They of the German personnel? Of the German personnel. And uh, they took a worse beating than we did. Of course, they started it, and that's bygones, though. <clears throat> and uh, I didn't quite understand, oh, when you, you said <coughs> that, did, did you mean, um, uh, that um, the German submarines might not help survivors if the submarines had been out for a long time and didn't have many provisions left if themselves? They, well, no, if they had provisions left or something like that, uh, it just depends on whether they were going in and out. I know some of them suck them and they would come up and uh, tell them the nearest land and wouldn't give them anything, but they were going out for a long cruise. Eh? And uh, they kept all the provisions for their set. Oh. And now the Japanese, they were a little bit different. My understanding from what I, I did not serve in the Pacific, I served in the Atlantic. <clears throat> but uh, my understanding is that the Japanese did not treat them as fair. They would even uh, surface and uh, machine gun the lifeboats Ooh. and uh, leave them. Uh, and then there's different stories to tell, which uh, nowadays we try to forget, but it's, it's history. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, Oh, before we get into talking about the uh, convoys uh, for a moment, could we perhaps get back to when you first went into the Navy, Charles, and uh, what happened from there? Well, I was drafted, to <laughs> be frank with you. But uh, I guess if I knew then like I know now, I would volunteer and come on out of high school and went on in service. Mm -hmm. uh, things, um, my little action may have helped. but. We went up to boot camp at Bainbridge, Maryland. That's a Navy base. That's the training. Naval base of training. And by the way, I stopped by there. My brother and I did uh, last year. And then the trees are growing up through the barracks and the drill holes and all that we uh, took training on and everything. And uh, this just letting it grow up like they do a lot of the bases where they don't need anymore. From there, we went uh, from uh, boot camp. We, came home on a little liberty in uh, nine days and back up and then volunteer for the armed guard because our brother Whitson had told us that it was the best outfit then because uh, of the loss of life. They had got it down to where they were, it was pretty safe and we wanted to be in the same outfit he did so we volunteered for it and went down to Camp Sheldon, Virginia, took our training and went back up to Brooklyn, volunteered and went out on the SS Myolus which was a Greek liberty. Oh, um, your uh, training in the Armed Guard, did that consist largely of gunnery school? The, the training I got of the Armed Guard was firing ammunition, loading ammunition, and uh, taking the barrels off the 20 millimeters and uh, using the semi fixed ammunition, and different types of ammunition. Okay. And we were strictly gunners except the few uh, radiomen and signalmen and the lieutenant that was aboard ship. Uh, that kept us under control. All right. In other words, give our money and uh, quarantine us to ship, and we've got to fight while we're ashore. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, for our viewers who may not be aware, 
Um, what types of targets might you have to shoot at? Well, there and uh, most of this was no targets. We were just practicing. Mm -hmm. Then they took us out to Damn Neck, Virginia, and gave us the live am ammo, and we had a old battleship that was sitting out in the Chesapeake, out of, and we went out on a gun tub, and we shot about five rounds out of that, and we shot some 20 millimeter out of the, at the uh, drones that were drawed over us there and on the beach, mm -hmm. and got a little, just, but we were trained with dummy ammunition and saved on ammunition. We just, we were trained on that to do a good job, and we could do a good job, too. Uh, yes, and uh, now let me see, Charles, um, uh, from uh, my uh, studying of some of your information, I believe that the uh, personnel in order to volunteer for the armed guard had to have a uh, good eyesight, good hearing, good teeth. Perfect. Why good teeth? Well, <laughs> there's just one in the dentist out there on that old water. Oh, yes. You may have to pull it out, but uh, they, they've got the men that were in good health. Well, the submarine crew was the same way. You know, they, uh, you can, if you're on land, you can get to a hospital or something like that. But out there, you had your uh, own little kit. And that's about it, aspirins, and that was it. Mm -hmm. Of course, as to why you need good eyesight, it's obvious to look for submarines and aircraft and so on. Um, incidentally, did they have infrared equipment to use back then? No, but you had to have good night vision along with the other two. A lot of people don't just don't see it Ooh. at night good. Uh, and you had to have good night vision. You were pretty well uh, picked out of the group. And then um, I thought it was interesting, right at the beginning of World War II, the uh, merchant ships were not equipped with guns, or, or not very well, and um, some um, fake gun emplacements were put on board using uh, telephone-type creosote poles and so on? That's right. I heard of it. My brother told me about it. One that got killed told me about it, which I don't have any proof of it now, but I am getting some letters, and they saw it. And uh, it is, it's a fact. Uh, they were short with guns, and uh, when you just start something like that, you're like getting into a fight. You're not prepared. You just uh, might lose for a few minutes, but you can always come back. And we did. I believe they did have some uh, machine guns at the beginning of the war, although they weren't um, uh, too effective. They had the Lewis machine guns there, and, and uh, they were morale boosters, what you might say. They just said, well, I've got a gun. I can fire back at you, and the plane coming in with better weapons and everything else. But that soon changed. We had uh, fair guns. Uh, of course, there's just the best uh, defense that we had was the destroyers, how about escorts, destroy escorts and planes with the baby aircraft carrier. Uh, they later developed them, them and they went along with us with the bi wing airplanes and uh, they could spot a sub in the water if he showed too close to the surface to fire torpedoes and uh, they were just a target then. We, they, that's the reason they started suffering so many losses. But it was up into early 44 before we really started to uh, do damage to them. Uh, you might have to shoot at German aircraft, submarines, and were there some German uh, surface ships? Oh, yeah, the, the, the Schoenhorst and sunk a lot of the cargo ships, uh, some of the cargo ships on there. Uh, one of the cargo ships, some, one of the German uh, raiders, the Steer, S-T-I-R, I guess what you, uh, and both ships went down. And that's in history. Uh, they, they did a good job on that one. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, did you, um, were you ever on a ship that fired at a German submarine? No. I was, I was fortunate. Uh, of course, my age was a, been, was, was a factor. We went in the latter part of the war. We was in the last convoy over, even though our brother got killed later. Uh, and there were other lives lost in the Atlantic. But we were in the last convoy, Ellie and I were, and we went to England and went over to Mary Mass and, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Belgium, Antwerp, Belgium, I'm sorry. Uh, Antwerp and Ghent, Belgium. And we were in Antwerp when the Germans surrendered. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, I guess they couldn't put up with both of us over there. Um, do you remember anything about your training in submarine tactics or any submarine uh, tactics? Um, well, well you, you were just stood back to back and on the ship, and uh, you were taught and trained that while you was ashore and uh, also... Uh, you had your pictures, you could tell at that time, you could tell practically every German uh, plane by just a flash. If you looked up and saw them, you could lead them in, and it was just training. Oh, did you uh, have to 
identify them in just a right, just a flash. Oh, they would that was schooling. In the um, training session, they would uh, flash a silhouette of a uh, German um, whatever airplane yeah, I mean, or ship. For and just the 109s, a, I could tell you by heart long then, but I'll, I'll lose them now. And they would just uh, flash it on the screen for a thousandth of a second, perhaps. Right, because so many of our American planes and so many of our of the enemy planes were built practically identical. Some of the motors was were the full motor bombers, say. Some of them ours was probably say middle of the wing. The other ones dropped lower and you had to distinguish those at a flash because, now don't get me wrong, we shot, I didn't do it, but a lot of men shot down their own planes. You don't look up too long when they're coming in. My understanding you did. Yes, and Charles, I understand that the armed guard were instructed to fire at a submarine even if they couldn't see the submarine, even if the submarine perhaps had already surfaced below the surface of the ocean, uh, nevertheless to keep firing because you might um, damage it. They, they were, they were, well you won't, uh, you didn't fire too much uh, that way, but if it, if you were given orders to, you did uh, put out some money. But uh, if he surfaced, you didn't take a chance whether it was an American sub or what, you fired on it and, uh, and we're worried about that later. Mm -hmm. now, I did say uh, on, on the, uh, uh, the last con the convoy that we were in, we went to Russia, I mean, uh, England. Uh, we were under surveillance, and they dropped a lot of depth charges around us for three days. Now, whether there were subs out there or not, I don't know, but it was, I remember the water how it just boiled up from the, those depth charges. And uh, if they sunk subs out there, I didn't know anything about it other than what we would get some scuttlebutt or something like that through. Mm -hmm. now, John, I'd like to show you one thing here is, uh, this is some of the ship. This was a, the S.O. tanker, F.W. Abram, that was sunk. And this shows uh, the actual sinking of that ship that's in the historical society. Here's another one. This one showing it burning. And that was the rest sore. Here's one with the hole in it where the torpedo blew a hole in it. Here's another one. This was a tanker. The Germans actually came up and shot this ship with uh, their deck guns after the crew had abandoned the ship and then put another torpedo in it so they wouldn't have a ship to go back to. <clears throat> this is what some of them says that it looked like when their home went down. And this was their home away from home when they out in the middle of that ocean. You had to be there to understand it. Here's a 5-inch 38 gun, which we got last and was real effective. And this is the one that's on the back of the Jeremiah O'Brien, which is in the San Francisco Harbor in California as a historical site. Anybody out there can visit that, and it's a good show. I'll show you the other side, and which shows the ship there as it is completed. Mm -hmm. Here are the baby flat tops. These are the jobs that right here was really good for us. They wouldn't have had a little air craft carriers on it and did the surveillance for us. This is the ships uh, fixing to go out to the North Atlantic. And this is from the Maritime Commission photo here. A lot of these ships are. We also have a ship of boats. Okay, Curtis word a new sinking by Art Moore. This came out in 83 and this shows all the ships, cargo ships sunk in it. Land. Mm -hmm. Also, we have the Liberty Ships by L.A. Sawyer, and this has just, it's just a good book on them. It tells all the ships that was in it. Here is a book, The Plane Shooter, and this is our insignia. And this was down at Camp Sheldon, uh, Virginia, the Armed Guard School. Inside on page 55, there's a picture of my brother and I, and we're together. And a lot of these guys, that we have located them because on the back side in this book, there's over 3,000 names here. And we took these and Xeroxed and sent it all over the United States so everybody we can get. Yes, Mr. Charles, we might mention right. to viewers who've just tuned in, we're talking to Mr. Charles Lloyd of Raleigh. And uh, Charles is a veteran of the Navy in World War II, and he belonged to the 
uh, Navy personnel who went aboard merchant ships during World War II and had uh, guns aboard to help protect the merchant ships. Um, we'll go ahead. I just oh, that's good. And uh, we took this. Of course, we ran into another guy that had another one of these books. And so we. Sh this is where we wrote locating it. One guy up in New Jersey found approximately 200 people in his area out of this book. I'd say about 150 of them are interested in it. And I think New Jersey will be a big factor next year. Oh, mm -hmm. with your reunion? Right. Mm -hmm. We start out, as I say, with 55 names and 82 at Winchester, and we have over 1,650, near 1,700 now. We have them in computer. We have over 4,000 ships already in the computer, and they're building up every day. And I'm, it's a, just a good thing to get them together, and you should read some of the letters we get from these people. Yes, well, where are some of the upcoming reunions of Navy Armed Guard veterans coming up, Charles? Our next reunion will be in Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, it'll be at the Holiday Inn in Norfolk, and they can get in touch with my brother L.D. and I, and I have uh, the address here on this paper here, and uh, we can, uh, they can contact us, and we'd be glad to give them information on it, and uh, they better make the reservation early because the hotels are filling up already. Okay, the simplest way for people to get in touch with you, Charles, probably is to look up Mr. C.A. Lloyd in the Raleigh phone book here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, Charles, where was the most dangerous uh, part of the ocean when you were a member of the armed guards? Ah, uh, before you even got out of the harbor. Some of them got sh sunk right in Chesapeake Bay, but I'm talking up and down the east, eastern part of North Carolina, and uh, up from North Carolina north, and in the North Atlantic, and then the ones that got really battered was the uh, PQ-16 and 17 that went to Mermatch, Russia, and the ones that went in there later on, uh, up until about 1943. And in some, uh, as you uh, indicated, in some ports, uh, such as Murmansk, uh, uh, it was also a lot of action. Right. When you pulled into port in Italy or Murmansk, Russia, and you were invasion force was nearby and everything, you were strafed day and night. And some of my brother, I know, he said he was uh, three days and night, he got no sleep. Just uh, it was one constant plane after another because it was all daylight and they could bum you 24 hours a, a day uh, and come in. Uh, one Allied vessel was stuck in the ice and uh, was constantly bombed by German planes? Right, and, and uh, they, they strafed that and bombed that con constantly. And see, it was just about 35 miles from Murmansk, Russia, over to where the German held their airfield right on the other side of the mountains. So uh, if they would uh, contact uh, me, uh, and, and I'd be glad to get them in touch with the reunion and where it's going to be there at uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And that date is April 24th through the 28th, 1985. And tell them to make plans. If anybody's listening, uh, armed guard, be there. Mm -hmm. um, I believe, Charles, that you were on one uh, foreign uh, vessel, a Greek cargo ship? Yeah, we served aboard all, uh, practically all the cargo ships as gunners. And uh, we, we had no nationality borders on that thing because uh, we were the ones that really protected the crews and the, and the ammo. Uh, with the exception of Great Britain, which supplied their own uh, yeah, armed guards. The armed guard and the, uh, were known as a different thing there, and, but they did the same job we did on their cargo ship. They were the DMS, and they were our good outfit, and we just located them. They're having reunions too. Okay, I didn't mean to be rushing you, but we're practically out of time. Charles, we, we very much appreciate your coming by. Perhaps uh, uh, one of your organization or yourself could come back again sometime. Be glad to, John, and because we want to get the word out, and that's the way to get it out, uh, we'd be glad to come back any time. Uh, we've been talking to Mr. Charles Lloyd of Raleigh, North Carolina. I might mention our uh, view. I might mention to our viewers and remind them, uh, please come to the Veterans Day Parade in downtown Raleigh, North Carolina, if you live in this area, Sunday, November 11th, 1984, at 2 p.m. in downtown Raleigh near the Capitol building. Uh, ceremonies will be held uh, near the Capitol uh, right after the parade, if weather permits. Thank you very much for watching.